Okay, we're live. Go ahead. Welcome to, um, welcome to our service and forgiving. And I want to give a special shout out to Miss Debbie for always, um, for always, for always watching our videos. Thank you. All right, special shout out to Miss Debbie, Pastor Debbie and for for um, always tuning in but uh, today's a special day for those of you joining us online um andrew and cody can i can i have you guys come yeah, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna honor you guys it's a big crowd here i know this is their last so we want to get you guys on on film too this is their last sunday here and we've appreciated Man, save the day. Uh, this is their last Sunday here. We've been faithful. Oh yeah, there we go. Andrew, Cody, you, you've been you've been faithful to to our chapel here, and many people have been blessed because of your ministry. So uh, we just want to say thank you, and uh, let's pray for let's pray for these gentlemen as we send them off into their into different parts of the world. Father, we thank you for for these two men of God. That they have in an institution where we're worshiping Jesus, and you, it's not it's not popular at most times. But these men have have stood out in faith and said, uh, "I'm going to let my light so shine that others would see my works and praise the Father." So we thank you for for the ministry they've done here, be in, here at Hornell Chapel and behind the scenes, things they've done in, in the local church. Uh, Cody's involvement at Heritage Christian Fellowship, and, and Andrew's involvement here. Uh, for, for years, for, for the three years he's been here. So we, we, we thank you for the ministry that they're going to bring uh, to the East Coast and that you continue to shine through them. And you, when others see their character, um, may they experience a little bit of God. May they see their works and praise you, Father. So we thank you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, without further ado, if you would uh, stand, sit, kneel, bend, you can, whatever you're going to do to praise God with us, let's, let's bring our hearts into a uh, position and a posture of worship. Deeper than any ocean, set my feet in motion, call me you. So I'll come holy before your throne, welcome me to your holy arms, draw me you. Your love is deeper. Your love is deeper than any Ocean, set my feet in motion. Call me you. So I come boldly before your throne. Welcome me to your open arms. Draw me you. It's okay, it's alright. It's okay, it's alright. Do your bright light and fall All the shame, all the guilt, all the condemnation I'm a new creation It's okay, it's alright I'll step into your bright light and fall All the shame, all the guilt, all the condemnation I'm a new creation
thank you that you're the way maker that you give us your truth your living word we thank you for the time of worship of us singing and also for the time that we're going to be worshiping you through the study of your word open our eyes to your truth today and may set us free and we ask these things in jesus name
All right. You know, it's I was sitting there thinking as as you were kind of doing the introduction and, and even singing the song to think that 15 weeks ago in this chapel nothing was going on, and uh, so I'm, I'm so thankful to, for this week being week 14 and uh, the weeks that have been going on and uh, gathering here as believers even even in a time of quarantine and a time of uh, just trial and difficulty in our nation. And I'm, th I'm thankful that we can come uh, here at the Horno Chapel, or if you uh, join us online uh, watching, I'm thankful we can be here, and I'm thankful for what God is doing in this place. Uh, sometimes I would say to myself, wow, uh, you know, I know God can do anything, but Camp Horno here at uh, Camp Pendleton, California, man, it seems like the backside of nowhere. But God can work here, and God can work anywhere. And I'm, I'm so glad God's doing work here. Uh, so, for our passage today, John chapter 3, John chapter 3, a familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, I title this message, Two Kingdoms, One Bridge, and a Big Decision. And I think you'll see what, uh, what I mean, what we're talking about here. John chapter 3 is a pretty familiar passage of Scripture, if you've been around the Bible a little bit, particularly in the New Testament. But before we dive right into the, the Scripture, I kind of want to kind of want to set the stage here. You know, uh, you can learn a lot by listening to a conversation. I have three teenage kids, and uh, my wife and I, you know, do our share of trying to communicate. Uh, get through uh, marriage and parenting and all this and my kids love to eavesdrop on our conversations and you know Well, dad, I heard we're doing this and it'll be no my mom uh, Mom and I were talking about that, but that doesn't mean we're doing that if you just listen to what we tell you You'd be okay, or I've learned a, a vital part Vital this is maybe the secret to to military service here the secret to national security I'm giving it out right online here. Okay is we have a ton of meetings just meetings, 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 right? And um, uh, there are a lot of meetings that I sit in really don't uh, directly apply to me. They're not necessarily chaplain meetings, if you will, or whatever, but meetings. But I can learn a lot by sitting in a meeting, and it may not necessarily be everything that I, I'm tuned in. Oh, yeah, that's great stuff. But like, oh, I hear little tidbits. It's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting. And so you can learn a lot by listening in on conversations and, or even meetings, listening in on those things. And you kind of find out what's going on, um, or, you know, like the kids listening into my conversations, sometimes they think they know what's going on or whatever. But as we come to John chapter 3, we meet uh, Jesus, of course, and, and a guy named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus and Jesus are having a conversation. And uh, John wrote, obviously, the book of John. John wrote this passage of scripture here. And uh, kind of think about, why would John record this conversation? I mean, think about it. If Jesus had roughly three and a half years of ministry uh, and, and about 33 years of, of life on earth, um, no doubt he had thousands of conversations, right? Thousands of conversations. I mean, he healed multitudes, multitudes of miracles, multitudes of conversations. And John picked two conversations, two out of thousands of conversations to record for us. One is here in John chapter 3. Uh, an extended conversation. The next one is in John chapter 4. And we, we find some other little exchanges, but nothing to the extent that we find in John chapter 3 and John chapter 4. So clearly, John thought that the, this conversation in the next chapter, and we're just looking at John chapter 3 today, that this conversation must be really important. It must be really important for us to understand who Jesus is, what Jesus is about, what we need to understand about Jesus. So important that John selected this conversation out of thousands that he no doubt was by Jesus' side for and recorded this one. So um, pretty important. Obviously, John thought it was a, a pretty important conversation. It's, it's really a simple conversation, but it contains some important truths. And we'll look at some of those important truths. And, and imagine what, what this conversation might have been like. Uh, scripture tells, uh, tells us here in John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. So here we have, uh, we're probably in Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago. No street lights, right? No traffic going off in the background. You know, maybe some cows or donkeys or something, you know, but no, no cars, no interstate noises. Uh, no waves at the beach if you're down at San Onofre. Uh, the moon, probably. Some stars. Uh, maybe some candles or oil lamps burning. Maybe some chatter, you know, people laughing over dinner or in their houses or whatever. No doubt, uh, we don't know what time at night. Maybe it was late at night. Maybe most people were asleep. Uh, in chapter 2, we find out Jesus had cleansed the temple. So Jesus has been in Jerusalem. So this is probably taking place in Jerusalem here. And, 
And no doubt that would have been an epic thing. I mean, word of Jesus going in and turning over the tables in, in the temple, that would have been like the talk of the town. So Nicodemus would have heard about this. And this, who is this Jesus guy that comes in and just, you know, making a wreck of the place, so to speak. And uh, Nicodemus is, is pretty curious about this. So he comes to Jesus by night. Nicodemus had heard about Jesus. Uh, he had heard about Jesus' miracles, and he wanted to find out more about Jesus. Now, the Bible tells us a little bit about who this guy was named Nicodemus. Um, and we find that, we already read the verse, he was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So a little background on this guy, we won't spend too long here, but Nicodemus is a Pharisee. That means he's a religious expert. I mean, this guy is, he knows his Old Testament Bible through and through. He is, he is a master of, of the Old Testament religion, a master of the Jewish religion. He's also a ruler of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin, one of the 70 ruling body uh, of the nation of Israel there in Jerusalem there. He's a moral man. He, he's a man of, of tremendous morals. He's a man of example. He's uh, hardworking. He's respected. He's highly educated. He, uh, he's ruler of the Jews. We already remember the Sanhedrin. We already talked about that. So in, in that society in Jerusalem, he was really kind of like a VIP. He was a big deal. Um, he was an important person, you know, not like the president or anything not like the important person but he's up there you know one of the top 70 in the in the country so to speak one of the uh, ruling nation there so he's this guy he's got some clout when he's coming to jesus this is like you know this is not like the peasant off the street coming this this guy's really hey tell me about this he's educated he wants to put the pieces together he's trying to understand how does this fit in the nation of israel who is this guy how does this fit in history and and all of this and he comes to Jesus, John tells us, he comes to Jesus by night. Now that's significant. Why does Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? Well, did he come so he would not be seen by others? Maybe he didn't want to be associated with Jesus. Did he come maybe because he was busy in the day? You know, a busy guy like that, you think, well, he's got a day job, you know? Uh, maybe he comes by night because, because he's busy. That was the only time he could come. Maybe the crowds were following Jesus, and that was the time he could, he could get alone with Jesus. Well, the Bible doesn't say exactly why he came to Jesus by night, but John does pick up on this truth, and, and later on the chapter, John kind of gives this play, and, and Jesus does as well. This light and darkness, light and darkness, and Nicodemus coming by night, we definitely have the picture of darkness, don't we, okay? So we don't know the, the reason why Nicodemus came by night, but it certainly factors in this this idea of light and darkness, day and night. And uh, we even saw that in John chapter 1, that light has come into the world and the darkness comprehended it not. Kind of see John making some allusions there, uh, going there. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. And of course, that's, that factors into the, the kind of the, the symbolism there. But how do you start a conversation with Jesus? You think about that. If Jesus were here today, how would you, how would you start a conversation? Well, we could say, well, I'm just going to pray and maybe acknowledging the deity of Jesus, but maybe, maybe if you didn't know, how would you start a conversation with Jesus? Well, Nicodemus started it this way. He started uh, right in chapter three, uh, beginning in verse, let's see, uh, verse two, he says to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that you do except God be with him. So Nicodemus starts this conversation with Jesus and he calls him Rabbi. Now, that's not a word we use a lot today, if at all, right? <laughs> Unless you're in a Jewish context. Um, he, he starts with rabbi. And for Nicodemus to call Jesus rabbi, that's probably, in Nicodemus's mind at least, a tremendous compliment. Because to earn the title of rabbi in that day, you had to be educated. Rigorous education in the law. Again, an upstanding example, a leader of people. And here, here you have Jesus, who never went through the school of the rabbis. Yeah, he certainly knew the scriptures. You have Jesus who, who never had the formal education that, that the rabbis would have had, who never studied under these great names. He didn't have the degrees to his name. And Nicodemus, being maybe gratuitous, at least in his mind, calls Jesus rabbi. Uh, well, uh, Jesus, um, you know, maybe Nicodemus meant it as, as a compliment, but Jesus knew who he, who he was, and he wasn't too worried about titles there. Um, and throughout this conversation... Uh, Jesus presents some, some basic spiritual truths that Nicodemus doesn't really understand. And so uh, Nicodemus starts with rabbi, and he says, We know you're a teacher come from God. Why? 
because no no person can do the miracles that you do except that God be God be with him. And so Jesus answers this. He, Jesus doesn't start by saying, "Oh well, thanks for acknowledging my my miracles," or or "Thank you for calling me rabbi." You know, even though I, I've never been to the schools. You know, thank thank you for this acknowledgement. No, Jesus he cuts to the chase. Jesus says, "Look," uh, and we find this in verse three. He says, uh, "Get back to verse three there." Uh, very, ver verily, verily, or truly, truly, depending on which version of the Bible you have there in front of you. Ver verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so right away, Nicodemus, like a rock thrown that hits you right between the eyes, Nicodemus is confronted with the truth. Jesus, Jesus uh, forgets the titles and the, the platitudes and whatever, and, and just hits him square in the forehead, so to speak, with some truth. He says, except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, what is that about? So spiritual truth number one that Jesus tells Nicodemus is, is this. From God's perspective, there are two realms or two kingdoms. Two kingdoms exist. And that's what he says here. He continues on. He, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answers and says, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus, again, goes back to this idea of the kingdom of God. And, uh, and, they, and he continues down. We'll read through verse 8 here. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes or where it listeth. And uh, you can hear the sound, but you cannot tell when it comes, uh, where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So Jesus begins painting this picture in Nicodemus' mind. And this picture is this. There are two kingdoms, or there are two realms. He's named the kingdom of God. He hasn't named the other, but it's definitely implied. The kingdom of this world, right? So we have the kingdom of this world, and we have the kingdom of God. Or, as Jesus terms it here in verse 6, that which is born of flesh, human, and that which is born of spirit. Okay, so we have the, the earthly kingdom with flesh, people, tangible life, and we have the kingdom of God, which is spiritual. And that's the truth that he's laying out here, that Christ is laying out. And Jesus is making the point that there are these two kingdoms. And um, with these two kingdoms, to enter into this kingdom of God, you must be born again, Jesus says. Now, it makes sense to enter into the earthly kingdom, to enter into planet Earth, to interact on planet Earth. You have to be born into planet Earth, right? I mean, which one of us were not born? You know, we might joke about whatever, you know, he was hashed or whatever. But every one of us have been, been born into this world, into this life, right? We are born into the kingdom of Earth. That's how we got here. No other way, right? None of us were... Uh, you know, teleported or whatever. Uh, we're born into this world. That makes sense, okay? And so Jesus is saying, all right, just like you're born of flesh into, into this earthly kingdom, to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to be born of the Spirit. You have to be born of the Spirit. And, and he even draws this analogy, uh, born of water in the, water in the Spirit. And so, uh, again, emphasizing the Word of God and, and and that God's working in a life there. So um, to enter, you must be born again. We know the rules of the earthly kingdom. We live in this kingdom, right? We know, we know the rules. You understand, like, oh, I have flesh. You know, if I, if I hit myself, it hurts. You know, if I accidentally get cut, I bleed. We understand the rules of the earthly kingdom. But the spiritual kingdom, we really don't understand too much about, do we? And Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you're asking questions. You want to know who I am? You want to know what I'm all about? What I'm all about is you understanding what this kingdom of God is about. And to, and to even see the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. You have to have the second birth. And Nicodemus doesn't understand that. He says, how, how can you be born again? How, a second birth? You know, you're going to be born from your mother again? What are you talking about, Jesus? You know, this makes no sense. Um, what Jesus is saying is it requires a second birth, a, a birth from above. Interesting play on words. We won't get into it uh, right now, but the word uh, born from above and born again, above and again are the same word there in the original language. And Jesus is, is making that, that play on words. So it makes sense. Flesh begets flesh. Spirit begets spirit. And it's the work of the Spirit of God. You know, 
Nicodemus would have believed in that day, like a, a good Jew, he would have believed, or he did believe, that all good Jews go to heaven. If you, you know, try to practice the Jewish law and, you know, bring your sacrifices to the temple and, and you're of Jewish heritage, then when you, you die, you're going to go to heaven. You know, the, the rest of the people, those Gentiles, well, we're not, we're not so sure about them. But, you know, if you're a good Jew, you're going to go to heaven. So Nicodemus would have thought, hey, I'm on the way to heaven. And what Jesus says to him is, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, unless you become born again, you're not even going to see the kingdom of God. Don't even think about entering. Now, that would have been a hard pill for Nicodemus to swallow. Because here's a guy that, you know, from the human perspective, if you were going to say, if, if anybody's going to, going to heaven, that's the guy. Because he's the example. He, he knows the Bible. He, he lives the Bible. He's upstanding, you know, uh, whatever. He knows it all. He lives it all, whatever. We would have thought, or the people of this day would have thought, that's the guy that's going to heaven. And Jesus says, if you're not born again, you don't even have a, a hope, a prayer. You're not even going to see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus is challenged in his theology. He's challenged in his belief. You know, that makes me think of today because it's not just a, a Nicodemus problem. There are a lot of people running around planet Earth today that think, well, you know, if you just do more good than bad, you're going to go to heaven. Or if you just try really hard or maybe pray every once in a while or maybe drop some, some money in the offering plate or, or, or help out your poor neighbor or just try to be good, then you're going to heaven. You know what Jesus told Nicodemus applies to us too. Except a person be born again, you're not even going to see the kingdom of God. We all need this second birth in order to enter the kingdom of God because there are two kingdoms. There's an earthly kingdom that operates by the earthly rules. There's a heavenly kingdom that operates by the heavenly rules, the kingdom of God. And to be in the kingdom of God, you have to be born into it. And uh, how do you become born into it? You're born by the Spirit. So the second spiritual truth that Jesus tells Nicodemus, and we're moving through this passage pretty quick, but Jesus tells Nicodemus this. Jesus tells Nicodemus there is only one way to get to the kingdom of God. There's only one way. I call that the bridge. And, and uh, he talks about that in verses 9 through 18. So we'll, we'll read those verses uh, quickly here. So Nicodemus, confused, he answers and says, How can these things be? I don't understand. Explain these things to him. And Jesus says to him, Are you a teacher? Literally, the teacher? Are you the teacher in Israel? And you don't know these things? Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you of earthly things and you believe them not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Maybe you recognize this next verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he continues, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Ooh, that's a lot of verses. Let's break it down. Uh, we'll just break down some major parts. We won't go through every detail. But what is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, there is one way to get into the kingdom of God. There's one bridge, if you will. There's one bridge, one way, only one way to be born again. And I'm about to tell you what this is. Now let's think about that. That's a pretty exclusive claim, isn't it? To say that there's only one way in the, the kingdom of God. There's only one way to get to heaven. There's only one way to have eternal life. Jesus, that's... That's exclusive. That's narrow. How can you make this claim? Well, Jesus makes this claim. He says he can make this claim because Jesus is from heaven. He says here, uh, back in um, verse 12, If I have told you of earthly things and you believe them not, how shall, um, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus is saying, who, who has gone up to heaven and come back to tell to tell about heaven and the kingdom of God? Who has come down from heaven to tell about it? Well, nobody has, except for Jesus. And if you really dig into this, and Nicodemus would have caught on to this super quick, although we might be a little slower to it because 
let's be honest, we probably don't know our Old Testament as well as Nicodemus did, okay? An illusion, a reference to Jacob's ladder. When Jacob has this vision and he sees the angels of God descending, ascending and descending uh, up the ladder, and, and, and the idea there is, whoa, the only way we can understand what heaven and what the kingdom of God is like is if God gives us a glimpse into it. And God gave Jacob a little glimpse into it, and now Jesus is saying, the only way you're going to get a glimpse is just like, just like Jacob could get a glimpse of it when he had that vision. Now the Son of Man, Jesus Christ himself, has come down from heaven to tell you what it's about. So Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, I am qualified to tell you that, that there's only one way in the kingdom of God because I've come from heaven. I have the credentials to tell you that. Make sense? And uh, so Jesus can make these claims, these exclusive claims, because he is from heaven. And what Jesus is saying is in keeping with the Old Testament. Jacob's ladder, and Jesus makes another reference. And again, one we may not know this so well, but uh, Nicodemus would have picked up on it right away. Ja, Jesus says to him, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. We won't go fully into the story, but this, the story there, the people are in the, in the wilderness, they've left Egypt, they're complaining, and, uh, and God's like, I'm sick of the complaining, so he sends fiery serpents, uh, snakes in, in the middle of the people that bite the people, and, and, and the bite stings and hurts and, and is fatal. And, um, and why did Jesus do it? Why did God send that? Was it because he wanted to get rid of the complainers? No, we'll see, see what God's doing here in just a moment. But, um, uh, and the people are like, well, what are we going to do? And G Jesus, or God, tells Moses, take a pole and, and take a, a brass form of this serpent and put it up there. And every time somebody's bitten and they, by faith, look to that pole and, and see this, this symbol of salvation, they'll be healed. All they had to do, if they were bitten by the snake, all they had to do was look up, look at the serpent on the pole, the, the brass form of it, and, be and believe that God would heal them, and they were healed. It was that simple. Just look and live, really, uh, was the idea there. And, and Jesus tells Nicodemus, just like that, just like that, that's the bridge. That's the way of salvation. That's the way into the kingdom of God. Now think about this just for a moment. Why would God send fiery serpents? I mean, isn't God a God of love? But here the people are complaining, they're murmuring, they're complaining against Moses, they're complaining against God. Um, God's goal was not to kill off all the complainers, okay? But let's face it, nobody likes a complainer, okay? I, you know, sometimes I'm a complainer too, and I don't like it. my wife doesn't like it either, you know? If God is a God of love and mercy, was his goal to kill off all the complainers? No, what, what did God really want? God wanted the people to uh, not be disgruntled, but to, to embrace his good plan and to follow his plan. Because God is a God of mercy, uh, and, and he wants us to live our life with his purpose and meaning, and let's face it, a disgruntled, grumbling, complaining life is not God's plan, right? So to get us out of that, or to get them out of that, uh, God provided um, a little bit of chastening and then uh, a, a right way uh, to bring them, and, and it's a way of faith. And so Nic Nicodemus, here's Jesus saying, hey Nicodemus, all that stuff you read in the Old Testament, you know, Jacob's ladder and, and Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, all that was, was a picture of me was a picture of the time when, when God would come in the flesh, qualified to tell you how to, be, how to enter the kingdom of God and, and be that message and to tell you what that's about. And I am him. I am the one that's come down from heaven to show you the way of eternal life. That's what Jesus is saying here. I, I am the one, and this all lines up with the Old Testament. Nicodemus, all that stuff that you spent all those years studying, which is all true, I am the fulfillment of that. And so Jesus tells Nicodemus, essentially, he doesn't use this word, but this is the idea here. Jesus tells Nicodemus that Jesus is the bridge, the way into the kingdom of God. That brings us to verse 16, probably the best known verse in the entire Bible. Jesus tells Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. What Jesus is saying is Nicodemus God's love for humanity is so great that he sent Jesus so people could be born again. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, there are two kingdoms. There's one bridge. In order to enter the kingdom of God, you need spiritual birth. 
and he says to, to Nicodemus and to us, it's pretty simple. If you're born into the kingdom of God, well, then you inherit the kingdom of God. You have eternal life. If you're not born into the kingdom of God, then, then you die without eternal life. You do not enter the, in the kingdom of God. And belief in Jesus is the bridge. So two kingdoms, one bridge. And then we come to verse 19, verses 19 through 21. Let's read them, and then we'll look at what, what it's saying here. Uh, verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light is coming into the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. See the light and darkness there? For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Depending on if you have a red letter version of the Bible or not, or maybe uh, whatever, you know, the scholars kind of go back and forth. Were, were verses 19, 19 through 21 kind of John's commentary on what Jesus said, or were they Jesus' words? Well, it doesn't really matter either way. It's still, it's still uh, the word that God has given for us. But what we see in these verses is really important. Christ has already presented there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of flesh, or the kingdom of the earth. There's the kingdom of the spirit. And they enter into this kingdom, you must be born again. Jesus has presented the truth that there's one bridge, one way into that kingdom of God, one way to be born again, and that is by trusting, by believing on Jesus Christ himself. That is, that is the way to cross the bridge into that second kingdom. And what, what is being said here in verses 19 through 21 is what I call a big decision. What Jesus is teaching mandates a big decision. Nicodemus came or Jesus is calling Nicodemus to make a big decision. Nicodemus maybe came for information. Jesus is saying, hey, you need to make a decision. And so we are called to make a big decision too. Each of us face this decision, a huge decision. In fact, the biggest decision you could ever make. It's not a call to a better life or less stress. It's a call to eternal life. It's a call to condemnation and death or life and peace and hope in a future. It's darkness and light. It's death and life. It's a huge decision. This is what Jesus is calling Nicodemus to. He says, Nicodemus, there are two kingdoms. You are in the kingdom of this world. We're all born into it. But there is this second kingdom, this kingdom of God. And although you're a good person, and you know the Bible, and you know all this stuff, the only way you can get in this kingdom is to trust me, to walk across that bridge, to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you are under condemnation. It's not, that, it's not that God came into the world to condemn you. No, the fact is God sent me because he loves you and wants you to be born again into this kingdom. But if you're not born again into this kingdom, then you have no hope. You will never even see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus, the big decision is, will you believe in me? Will you trust me to be your savior? Somebody put it like this. The gospel tells us we are far worse off than we ever thought. And that's what Jesus tells Nicodemus. You're far worse off than you ever thought. You're never even going to see the kingdom of God where you are. The gospel tells us we're far, far uh, worse off than we ever thought, but we are loved far more than we could ever imagine. Nicodemus, far worse off than you ever thought. You're never even going to see the kingdom of God where you are. But God loved you far more than you, you ever imagined. So he sent away, sent a bridge that you could leave the kingdom of this world and have eternal life and enter the kingdom of God, be born again into that kingdom. So we get to listen in this conversation, don't we? Jesus talking to Nicodemus. The information that we hear is vital and it demands a decision. So I ask you tonight, are you a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Have you been born again? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Oh yes, you're definitely born into this world. If you're able to sit here or watch this online, you're, you're part of the kingdom of, uh, on earth, right? You've been born of flesh. But have you been born of the spirit? Have you been born again? It's not something super mystical. It's not something that you do to yourself. You didn't bring yourself into the world. You didn't birth yourself, did you? No. Now, you were part of the process. 
kind of a passive agent to some degree, right? Same thing with being born into the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't tell Nicodemus, hey, Nicodemus, you need to do these five things. You need to go here or eat this or swallow that or whatever. No. He says in verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Just like being born into this world is something that happens to you, being born into the kingdom of God is something that happens to you. In this world, it was the work of your mother, or maybe the doctor performing the C-section. I don't know. Uh, in this world, or in this kingdom, it's the work of the Holy Spirit of God. He does the work, but you have to let him do it. You have to invite him to your life. So Nicodemus, you have to believe in me. You have to place your faith in Christ. That's what Jesus tells Nicodemus. That's what we are told too. And I ask you, have you been born again? Have you believed on Jesus? Have you been born into the kingdom of, of light, into the kingdom of God? Do you have the promise of eternal life? You know, it kind of reminds me of this, and I'll soon be done. It reminds me uh, of a, a person clinging on to, to a piece of driftwood as the ship that they were on is sinking. You know, and somebody throws them a life raft, and there the life raft is. And they can cling on to that piece of driftwood that's slowly taking on water, and if they hold on to it long enough, it's eventually going to take them down. But if they're ever going to be saved, if they're ever going to be delivered, at some point they've got to let go of what they've been hanging on to that seems so secure. They have to let go, and they have to place their faith on something else that they haven't tested out yet. They have to place themselves on that life ring and hang on to it, and then somebody else pulls them to safety. That's what this salvation is very much like. Nicodemus, let go of what you think and trust that Jesus is the way into the kingdom of God. Place your faith and trust in him. That's what it's about. Jesus tells Nicodemus, and we see today, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Believing on Jesus is the way. Two kingdoms, one bridge, a big decision. Have you made that big decision? If not, will you make that big decision to trust in Christ? If you have, let's help other people make that big decision too. It's life or death. It's eternal. It's light and darkness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, thank you for the Apostle John writing this conversation for us. Lord, we need to hear what you provided for us. Lord, thank you for Nicodemus coming by night and talking to Jesus. And Lord, later we find in the book of John that we get some indication that maybe not that night, but at some point, Nicodemus maybe became a believer. And then he placed his faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, the truth of the matter is there are thousands, if not millions on this planet, millions even, who have placed their faith on Jesus Christ. And they can testify that when they do that, their life is changed forever because they are born of the Spirit. Father, I pray that we would know that we are born of the Spirit, that we have eternal life. And Lord, uh, if someone does not know that, Lord, someone here that's not sure what that means, Lord, I pray that they would trust you, that they would believe in you and be born into your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Andrew, for that. Uh, the message is so... Um, thank you, Andrew, for that message. It's, uh, it couldn't be any more clear. There's just one bridge. There's just one bridge. And it's pretty exclusive. Some people would call that arrogant, that Jesus is the only way. But he is the only way. And uh, so thank you for that. I know this is your last sermon that you'll ever, not ever, it's your last sermon in here for a long, long time. So thank you, brother, for your ministry to us. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you. We're just so grateful for what you've done here for us and been preaching the word here for, for 15 weeks now. Um, I saw I saw a meme that said, uh, you know, um, social justice without Jesus Christ is just like rearranging furniture in a burning house. And it's, people want reform, they want change, they want, they want to fix racism, but there's no message of Jesus Christ. There's no mention of this one bridge and it's a dead end. And if you're if you're listening online, you're trying to change the world without Jesus. It's 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 pointless. So thank you for that message that Jesus Christ is the only way. Uh, let's let's sing about Jesus, the King of my heart.